Okay, this one's this one's raw. And and we're talking like Chatsworth raw, if you know what I'm saying. I just tweeted out that I blew up a processor. And we're gonna talk about that. A few things happened here. But it was kind of like I was in the middle of doing a different video and now I'm making this video, obviously. I asked you guys if you wanted me to do this video about how it blew up and maybe you guys can learn something. And uh, yeah, we're doing this. This is this has to be done. I air all my mistakes. This, as you might recognize, is the budget gaming system I built out of my own money to kind of do a series here where I upgrade this over time and see what kind of decisions I make when I'm putting my own money on the line. It was some pretty interesting choices here. And it ended up in a form, not its final form, it's still not in its final form, but with an 8320, uh, from AMD and an GA990FXA UD3 motherboard allowing for overclocking and such. Ever since I did the KB Lake shootout video a few days back, I could not stop this nagging feeling that there was better gaming performance to be had, even from like five year old processor technology here, almost six years old at this point when the 8300 series launched, than there was on any hyper threading K skew overclocking i3 available on the market today. I thought, you know what? We, this needs to be done. I need to test this. I took the SSD and the 1080 out of the KB Lake rig behind me there, and I put them in this rig here and decided to put it through the exact same test I did with the i3, i5, and i7 to see how it really compared. And guess what? We were seeing some pretty damn impressive numbers from the 8320 overclocked to 4.4 gigahertz compared to the i3 at 4.7. It was beating it in, in Cinebench, it was beating it in TimeSpy, I didn't get to do the rest of my tests, and we're gonna talk about why. So I started getting greedy and I went, you know what, I bet this CPU has at least 4.6, and even if I could get 4.7 out of it, that'd be awesome, because then we have another direct 4.7 gigahertz comparison. Yes, I know the architectures are different, yes, I know AMD and Intel direct, Frequency speed is not comparable across the platforms. I know that it just would have been neat being like, hey, all of these were at 4.7, kudos. Well, the UD3 was being kind of weird where even though I was telling it to do 1.45 volts, which is very safe, even with a cooler like this one here, which is, this isn't a Hyper 212. Uh, I can't remember which one it is. It's a step below the 212, but still plenty of cooling. In fact, we were only seeing 60C on the package at the 1.45 volts at 4.4. So I was happy with that. And I figured we, we got more room than that. So I put in 1.5 volts. And that's safe. It, believe it or not, it's still safe for AMD. It's it's on the edge of air cooling. You know, you really got to keep an eye on things. I noticed that when I was doing Cinebench, that the voltage was dropping down to 1.3125 ish, like 1. 1.325, 1.33 between there, and then the cores were slowing down to 4.3, even though I had them set to 4.6. So that dawned on me, oh yeah, I didn't change the line load calibration settings in the motherboard. See, what happens when you put these CPUs, graphics cards are the same as what I'm about to explain here. When you put them under load, there becomes a bit of a voltage drop across the board, where even though you're telling it send it 1.4, it might only get 1.3 or whatever, because as the CPU is fluctuating and doing its different tasks, it starts to pull voltage and you get what's called a V-droop and where the, the voltage won't be steady across the board. So what you have to do is you have to go into overclocking uh, settings and most good motherboards that are designed for overclocking are gonna have good line load calibration settings in there where you can t basically tell it to take whatever the baseline is and add a percentage of voltage to it so that you can say, okay, you wanna account for the drop. So under load or line load calibration, let's go ahead and go to either normal or extreme profiles. There's different settings on there. Basically, like I said, it's a percentage increase of voltage across the board to allow for that droop. So I put the multiplier to a 4.6 gigahertz setting, went into Windows, no problems whatsoever, went into Time Spy, beat the i3, no problems whatsoever, beat it on CPU score, beat it on GPU score, and it beat it just on, on combined everything. It was just like, I was like, this is awesome. I'm gonna be able to show people there's no point in buying the 7350K. So then I went into Cinebench and I had hardware monitor going so I could keep track of things like the voltages, the temperatures, uh, all of that stuff. I'm monitoring everything. And I've noticed something interesting that it's going 1.5, 1.55, 1.59, 1 1.6 volts on air, and I'm going, wow, that's interesting. It's it's going up quite a bit on voltage, but it passed the test, and I saw that max temperatures were only sitting at about 67C on the package, and I thought, wow, that's actually not that bad. But you know what? That's not safe. That's not safe at all. So I should probably shut down the system, go back into BIOS, and then see, you know, pull the voltage back down a little bit to account for the line load calibration is gonna add a little bit more. So I tell the system to restart. And this motherboard has something interesting in it where when you tell it to restart, it will power down completely, 
and then turn back on. Whereas a lot of motherboards will stay powered on as a, as a constant voltage supply and then just restart itself. Well, this one, because like I said, it turns off, when I hit restart, the system turned off. And then it powers back on and immediately powers right back off and doesn't come back. And I'm seeing the telltale sign here of, uh-oh, because every time I push power, I would get just an, an immediate flick of power. The fans would all kind of budge for a second and then stop. But that's usually a sign of something is wrong with CPU power delivery. Yeah, I was like, uh-oh, that's not good. So I cleared CMOS, no, no repair whatsoever. Took out the graphics card, took out the memory, took out everything uh, except for the CPU on there, same result. Unplug the power delivery to the CPU, the eight pin EPS power, the system turns on. Now it's very, it's very unlikely that the motherboard is bad on this. I have, in fact, I have another CPU that I'll find some time later to drop in here. It's like an old 6300. I'll drop it in here. If it powers on, I know the motherboard's good. I'll buy a new CPU. We'll be back up and running, and then that series can continue. But I want to explain why this happened and what I should have done differently. So to first understand why the CPU died, you have to understand how motherboards work and how they turn on. Now, certain parts of your motherboard are always under constant power and 12 volt supply. If that wasn't the case, then when you push power, nothing would happen, right? Because that's plugged into your motherboard. So there's always parts of your motherboard that are powered on, waiting for a uh, momentary switch like your power button to tell it to turn on. Well, the way it turns on is it basically slaps your system across the face with voltage and says, hey, turn on. When you do that, usually those voltages when they first turn on are spikes. They're, they're much higher than the initial voltage are gonna run out. So it's kind of like a quick peak of, of power, high voltage, and then it comes down really fast to say, hey, you know, this is what we're supposed to run at because as it does its post and it starts loading up the BIOS, that's when it goes, here's what the voltages need to be. It looks an awful lot like because the voltages were set so high and with line load calibration and because it basically took a base of 1.5 and then slapped it with voltage, who knows what it hit it with, but the moment it tried to turn it on and it slapped it across its face, like Ronda Rousey's recent fight, uh, it died. That's when it died. Here's what I should have done differently. When I realized the voltages were so high, especially after I already knew that this freaking motherboard turns itself off to restart, I should have just powered it down, cleared the CMOS, and then I wouldn't have had this issue. Had I done that, the system would be alive today. I'd be able to do all the benchmarks and show you guys more definitive proof that it is absolutely unnecessary to buy the 7350K. Yes, I know AM3 has no upgrade path. Yes, I know blah, 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 answered all the AMD hate here, but it still was beating the i3-7350K hands down, and it's a hell of a lot cheaper to be able to achieve that because with the 7350K, you have to buy an expensive Z270 board to be able to take advantage of all of those overclocking features. So when you put those two together, you're spending at least $300 upwards of 350, 400, depending on what you want. And yes, there is an upgrade path. You can upgrade the CPU later, but there's no point in spending $189 on a CPU just to upgrade it later. Just save more upfront and buy a better CPU to start. The 7350K shouldn't exist as far as I'm concerned at the price that it does. So there's my opinion on that. But anyway, that's just, that's it. I wanted to kind of tell you guys that, hey, we were beating it. We were beating the 7350K with the 8320 and I was proud of that. And this is one of them highly unedited videos, but that's okay because allow me to share this with you guys. So if you think your voltages might be too high or you think something is wrong, do yourself a favor, clear your CMOS before restarting your system, especially if the voltages are really high like mine was. I'm an idiot. I was impatient. I wanted to get the video done and guess what? Now I don't get to do the video at all and I've got to spend more money out of my pocket to get another AMD processor because of the fact that I blew it up. And no, I'm not gonna allow someone to send me one and I'm not gonna ask for one for sponsorship because the whole point of this build was it had to be out of pocket. What I just experienced was a mistake of mine that's costing me money out of pocket. So the best I can do is at least feel the pain of spending another $150 on an 8320E and uh, get it up and running from there or just decide what I'm gonna upgrade it to in the future. But there you go, guys. I, uh, first processor I've killed in over, t over 10 years. It's probably been more like 15 years at this point. Maybe even more. The last processor I, I killed was a Pentium D. So you do the math. I killed a Pentium D. All right, guys, time to go. I'm depressed. I don't like killing hardware. I don't care if it's expensive hardware and I don't care if it's cheap hardware. I don't like killing hardware. And this is, this is up there with me on how I felt after drilling holes in the motherboard.